labels or car versus CT. That's not controversial. And oh, there's comments. It's coming. I'm sure there's a few comments coming. We're, we're, we're going to have to do, do better marketing, I guess. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, I think, yeah, I think uh, we have a lot of online participants. Yep. I mean, we are already done pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're ready to start. Let me go back to the slides. Okay. I um, so. Yeah. I mean, we, we shouldn't wait for the room to fill up. I don't think it's going to. Yeah. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, so you're, you're in the LSR working group. It's pretty hard to get that wrong online. So only those two other people in the room. Hope you're there for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, ITF 113, hybrid meeting. Uh, we have a, well, here's a note well. Uh, I swear there was one that we could get that was readable, but shorter, I mean. It basically says every everything you do in the ITF is donated to part of the ITF. Um, okay, it doesn't we don't have an agenda slide, so I'll just quickly mention uh, our, our agenda is fairly full. Um, so we will try to keep people to their uh, Things uh, I think somebody else said that it's ridiculously full or something like that. Some added I, I I feel that was unfair. We we left like five minutes slop at the end, <laughs> uh, so hopefully we don't we don't run to the very end. Um, and with that, I think uh, AC is going to run the status. So I'll I'll, I'll click AC. You talk. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to see if I can get this done. I'm going to get this done in less time. Uh, I'm just going to point out new stuff. Okay, no new RFCs. We do have a new draft on the uh, RFC off 48 or in in uh, off 48. That's the ISIS reverse metric. Uh, next slide. Or do I? Do... Yeah, reverse reverse metric Yang, right? Yeah, Yang, Yang, right? Yeah. The ISIS reverse metric. Right? So this is one way we can uh, we can do these one offs, but. Uh, for certain things as well as including them in the base spec. This hasn't changed. Next slide. Uh, we're still um, flex algorithm. We did have one comment on that about the sub TLV overflow. I, I guess we're the offers are going to cover that in the in the in the draft. It's in AD review as well. Next slide. Uh, these are all, these are ones, uh, the, the last two are the ones we uh, added. We requested publication on the flood reflection, which is like a route reflector in ISIS and the BFD strict mode uh, where you require BFD to establish the OSPF adjacency. Next slide. And these haven't really changed. We've been kind of waiting for these Yang models to publish the base Yang models before we working group call the last. They, I think it'll happen hopefully before next IETF. It all depends on the BFD Yang model. Next slide. Uh, the offers of Flex algorithm have requested working group last call. We probably can do that one fairly soon. The same with re reverse metric and uh, is also, it's just a OSPF version of an ISIS. So we probably can do that pretty simply as well. Next slide. And I don't want to say anything more about that. We really haven't had much movement on these. Next slide. Next slide. If you see your draft and you want to start uh, start discussion, start it on the list. Next slide. Oh, I didn't update. I didn't update that. The flex that that sub comment on uh, flexible algorithm bandwidth delay and metrics 
That's wrong. It's that was from last IETF. It's not covered today. There's just discussion going on between the authors on that one. And final slide. Uh, not the final slide. Oh, this is one the offers of I don't have the pen on these. I guess I'm an offer on one of them. I got I got to get these were accepted by the working group, but the offers never uh, updated them with the uh, I mean, they were they were adopted, but the offers never uh, republished them. So they should we should I'll, 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 I'll uh, I noticed that when going through this, the existing documents, I'm going to get a hold of them to do that. Next slide. And we had a bunch of adoption requests, not a bunch, but a bunch of highly, a couple of highly contentious ones, and they did not, they were not adopted. And I imagine, I, I imagine some of the documents that we have today will be asked for adoption. Okay, that's it. Again, I encourage you, I didn't want to spend a lot of time because we have a real full agenda on the working group status. I just was an MPLS. They even covered their their erratas in their status. So next presentation, which is That's also it. me. Yeah, I think you're up next. Hang on, let me pull the let me click the yeah, share. I know, I know. Let's be up terminology. So this started out uh, actually. Uh, a couple years ago, both the IETF and uh, a lot of the large companies, IBM and Cisco notably, uh, wanted to change these standards so we can update our documentation to have inclusive language, specifically in OSPF, getting rid of the master slave terminology in the OSPF database exchange. So Mike from IBM contacted uh alvaro me and alvaro and tried to get and we and we uh, uh kicked off this effort this this is a draft that just updates the current and let's go to the next slide i'm going to try and do this one fairly quickly too so alvaro did the initial work on this i agree with them we replaced master slave with leader follower in in all the uh in all the sections we don't actually do it we don't actually do a biz draft on RFC 2328, but we have a document that, that, that updates it and notes the sections. This draft notes the sections that uh, will be changed. Additionally, we're gonna place the MS bit, which is master slave bit with L bit. Now this is really a good change because now all the diagrams that had to have a two character field for a one bit go down to one. So it, it really makes, it may, it'll, may, it'll make the dot, the, if we, if when we redo, when and if we redo these documents, it'll make the diagrams uh, a lot easier to look at. And this also required an IANA action because we had a registry for the database description flags. Next slide. These are the sections that change. There was just a, 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 a small reference in 7.2, and most of it is in the native data, data, data structures, uh, chapter 10, which also, it's kind of a misnomer, the name of this section, it really includes the neighbor uh, FSM as well, and all the events and everything. These, this is where the, the majority of the changes are in RFC 2328, which is the um, internet standard document for the OSVF V2. Also in appendix three, there's a, uh, a figure including the database description packet. And that's where the MS bit's gonna be changed to the, is changed to the L bit. Again, this document just updates it by making the reference. It doesn't actually replace it. Update 2328. So I, Alvaro did, and Mike both noted that this document need to be updated. I went through the other documents and looked for references. Next slide to master slave. Oh, and I found OSBF v3. Luckily, since OSBF v3 builds on v2, the only reference was in the IPv6 uh, figure with the database exchange packet. Next slide. 
And we have a few of these. There was one example rec reference in RFC 4222. Uh, it's going to update that. The out of bound uh, synchronization. We might want to, we probably want to do a biz on this one anyway, but this updates it. There's a, there's a uh, picture of the packet and some annotation in that one too, because it allows. The reason we want to do this one over is because dynamic, uh, well, ISIS has a way to do out of band uh, synchronization today. Um, OSPF doesn't. And uh, the dynamic flooding has situations where you get into a problem that, problem where you've done flooding reduction and you want to make sure you're in sync. So you know how OSPF can, act, I mean, how ISIS can ask for complete C, C, SMP PDUs. OSPF needs to be able to do the database exchange out of, out of uh, band as well. And then there was, uh, Richard O'Gerr did this uh, informational draft. There's a couple just ancillary references. This updates that as well. Last slide, I mean, not last, but next slide. And what, uh, Monet, uh, this Monet experimental draft had some changes to this neighbor state machine, which uh, referenced the, the MS, the master slave relationship and the MS bit in the data description packets. And finally, uh support the rfc the Sorry. ipv4 address or ipv different address families and i in osbf v3 there was an mtu consideration so it just had a picture of the snippet of the database description packet where you would have the flags and that had it as well so this up this draft updates them as well and the final slide now i want to say something really one really good thing about this unlike VRP where it was all over, is that the MIV and the Yang model did not have any references. Those things actually take deprecation and functional code changes or you know implementation changes to support. OSPF doesn't have any of those where you really, you know, where you, where, where, where you need to deprecate tables and do it the old way. So luckily, the next step would be, there might be some discussion. We've kind of discussed this among ourselves. We think this is a natural ch choice. It's really nice that we have an L bit rather than an MS bit. The reason it was the MS bit is the database exchange already had the more bit to, to say when you were done sending database exchange packets. So this L bit makes it uh, a more concise in the figure. We, uh, like I'd say, don't, just say, oh, why don't you make this primary, secondary, or some things like that, unless you have a real good reason why. I mean, there, there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of wordsmithing that goes on, but I don't, I don't think I think this is a this this, and I'll credit Alvaro for coming up with this choice. I think this is a really good choice, leader and follower, because it's analogous to what's actually happening in the database exchange. And uh, finally. I think we need to, you know, we talked about biz work on just on these documents anyway. I think we need to do this in the interim because like I said, my company and IBM and others really want to update our documentation as soon as possible. So if we can nail down what the uh, what the terminology is going to be even before this is published, that would be good. Thanks. Yeah, um, I think I, I think I might have put on the list the idea about the uh about doing abyss and revving. I, I'd like to, we don't have to do it for this rev, but I think I think it's worthwhile um, since we do have errata. Mm -hmm. um, and I and what was on the list is people think that, well, it's gonna, you're gonna open it up to a can of, open up a can of worms, right? Like, I don't think we have to. I think we could just say, you know, we're just doing errata and this, and this change. Maybe the, having this document even makes it easier to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially, so you especially say, if one, we're just going to do a rata and this document, right? right. Especially of twenty three twenty eight because that's already all the way to internet standard, right? Yeah, I mean, my, my only, I'm thinking, I guess this is enough for companies. But if I was, you know, actually looking for the documentation on OSPF, right? I'm still going to pull twenty three twenty eight. Whether you have an updated thing out there saying, you know, use this new language, it's still there, right? 
-hmm. So I don't know. Anyway, it seems like to me the biz is better, but uh, we can probably talk about this forever. And no one else is in the queue. So, yeah, so no okay. one else feels like talking about this. That's yeah, great. While you're, while you're bringing it up, uh, there's John. That if, it's, if it's outside of, if it's out, like my car, I don't look at the, I look at my product documentation for my car. I don't look at the, you know, the, uh, the ISO uh, standards <laughs> to see how, right. how things work there. Well, it may be even better that you look at the, the um, show OSPF neighbor, right? You're looking at the dashboard of the car and not the manual. Yeah. <laughs> John? Yeah, I, I was debating whether to say anything, but since you brought it up, um, yeah, I, I had kind of the first, you know, initial reaction you did, Chris, which is, you know, you, you already said it all already, but then as AC was going through his slide deck, he was like, and this RFC is impacted, and this RFC is impacted, and this RFC is impacted. Like, that's a lot of RFCs. So like, I, yeah. I, I do see the value of publishing one short document that you know, says what the updates are to all of them. But I, I would hope that you, know, you would at least consider then subsequently, you know, as, as you get around to it, busying those to like, actually take care of rolling in the changes. Because I, I do think for the reason you said, Chris, like in, in my opinion, as, as really just an individual contributor here, but I, I think it's it's better to have it in the spec itself. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John. All right. Well, I guess we'll go to the next, which is the uh, node liveness, Tony. Let me see if I can. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off my audio. At least. Tony Lee, are you here? Are, are you presenting the node liveness protocol? I know I saw you in here talking earlier. So. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm ready to present. All if right, you give let me, me see if I can. Control, I will happily do that. Oh, wait, I just clicked on something that opened your profile, which is not what I wanted. There it is. Pass slide control. Oh, I wonder what it's going to choose. Do you, you have a choice cool? there? Awesome. There we go. Can everyone see slides? Yep. Very good. Uh, so this is a proposal that is in response to the discussion about PUA. And I'm assuming that's still a live proposal. Uh, so the problem where we're talking about um, people have been using LSP presence in the LSDB as a substitute for node liveness. And this suddenly doesn't work as soon as the network graduates up to hierarchy. Uh, you know, somebody dropping off in a level one area just doesn't appear on the other side of the network anymore. Uh, so there are a bunch of other proposals that we've discussed. Um, PUA, putting loopbacks in BGP, don't aggregate the loopbacks, many other ideas. Um, the root problem here is that IGPs are carrying live, uh, reachability, not liveness. And if we want to talk about liveness, we really, really need another mechanism. Uh, the IGP is not a dump truck. It is not meant to carry everything. If you're confused, this is a dump truck. Okay, here's another dump truck. Uh, I'm proposing that we s create a completely separate service. Uh, consider this another protocol within the routing area. Um, and this would be a publish subscribe service, pub sub kind of approach. Uh, basically, any data that we want to carry around but don't want to put in the routing protocols, we could put in here. Um, the basic idea is that this would run on ABRs, although there's actually a, a neat way of not running it directly on the ABRs. And um, I've, con I've added some simple register notification messaging. Uh, I have no expertise in pub sub architectures. So apologies if I've messed something up. Uh, contributions most welcome. Uh, and this is intended to be more general than just liveness, despite the title. Um, I have already heard a proposal that we stuff a bunch of capabilities into this. And that would be most welcome. All right, the idea of this is pretty simple. 
Um, B and C are some a, a pair of ABRs running this protocol. And Robert comes up and he wants to talk about loopbacks. He's looking for liveness information about particular addresses. So he fires off a registration message and he talks to his ABR, router B. Router B looks at the prefix that A, a has requested and says, oh, I know that that's over in area two. I'm going to send a registration over to router three, the ABR for area two, and register for the loopbacks coming from area two. Uh, router C now sees liveness events where a node within area two drops off. And he sends a notification saying that you know this router has fallen off of the world, off the face of the earth. And he forwards that back to router B. Router B, in turn, sends that notification back to router A. All right. Um, doing this is not hard. Um, the easiest way of doing this is to put all of your loopbacks in a single hierarchical prefix. Um, your local ABR registers for all remote, more specific prefixes. Okay, if you do this right, you've got N nodes per area and A areas with two ABRs per area. Then an ABR is going to have N local sessions and registrations and two times A minus one remote sessions and registrations. So this is uh, about 3,000. And, and this is entirely sustainable. And those of you with BGP implementation experience will not be scared by this number. If you really don't like running this on your ABR, you can actually do this on any IGP speaker in the area. And that makes it nice because you can now run this actually on non-router hardware. And it can scale with cheap memory. So this is actually helpful. Um, I did add IGP capabilities so that we can identify the speakers here so we don't actually have to configure that. All right. All of the rest of this is just boring TLV definitions. Um, I'm not going to talk through them in boring detail. There's registration message. Then within a registration mes message, there's a sub TLD saying liveness for this prefix. There's a notification message, and it carries sub TLDs. And it carries liveness notifications for a prefix. And there's a capability bit for ISIS, and a capability for OSPF. And that's it. Any questions? Looks like um, Aijin is in the queue first. Whoa, <laughs> lots of queue. Go ahead, Aijin. The, the, the first question, is, I think uh, uh, there are exist uh, the PubSub mechanism. So why we uh, invent a new PubSub mechanism? And, uh, and the second question, why we invent such mechanism within the IGP working group? The, sec the third question is, uh, you know, the, the, oh. the price is not only the, on the ABR, is not only for the season, season number, but, on, but also but for the um, registered information. You know, the ABR must keep the, the register table. So uh, I think this is uh, will give the pressure, give the pressure to the ABR. And, uh, and you also mentioned that uh, the uh, you can find the uh, other IGP node within there to to do the work, but I think uh, such work can only be be done by the ABR. So uh, I sure? think uh, such work will stop um, for a second. Will give uh, more pressure on the ABR. Okay. Okay. You buffer overrun massively. <laughs> um, I've been up since two a.m. Um, I am not working on all cylinders. I certainly cannot buffer all of that. Um, so going back to your first question, um, why a new pub sub mechanism? Um, I have not seen a pub a similar pub sub mechanism in IS, in uh, IETF. Um, if there is such a thing, I don't know about it. Feel free to point me at it. 
um, you know, I'm happy to reuse it if we've got something. Okay, and I've already forgotten what your question two was. Could you please repeat? Could you please repeat question? You went to the PubSub mechanism within the ITP working group. I think the, the notification uh, um, message and the, the mechanism is not related to the ITP. So I think if you want to invent a new uh, notification um, protocol, I think uh, you can try to uh, form one new working group. I think you, as you have said, uh, the such mechanism can be used to uh, transfer other uh, non ITP related information. Uh, I agree that this could go outside of this working group, but the problem that we're trying to solve here was raised in this working group. Um, so I started off here. Um, even if it had been in another working group, we would have been presenting here in uh, LSR because of the LSR problem. So if, if the working group decides that this is interesting and we want to go forward, I'm happy to take it where, wherever the area directors want it to go. Okay. Next, All right, next Linda. Question. I know Aishan had more questions. Yeah. Familiar with, uh, Clarification uh, question. Oh, so sorry. I think maybe uh, it is not uh, the right place for for the for for this person to evaluate the process. Okay. Okay. So my question is clarification. So I see you do registration. Uh, do you only do the registration for the node which has client attachment, or is every node? I'm a little confused on that. Uh, so the way this is currently described, we're doing registration for entire prefixes and everything underneath a prefix. So that allows us to do a very nice thing where uh, router A can actually generate a single registration mechanism uh, message uh, that covers all of the loopbacks for the entire network. Oh, and so then, it's registration yeah. for for his own loopback addresses, not for the client, because no. like A, B, C, D, each can have a bunch of client prefix attached. So I'm, I'm curious, like which one do you register? He's registering for all loop, all clients' loopback addresses throughout the entire network. Okay, isn't that same as LSA? You advertise all the prefixes attached to you? No, we're not advertising anything here. This is a request. Oh, request. Oh, OK. I got right. it. Thank you. Please, please tell me about the liveness for everything in 10 slash 8. <laughs> oh, so it's A request B and B respond back. OK. Well, C response. I see. I see. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Hi, this okay, is uh, still... Hemanshu. Yeah. Um, Tony, have you considered uh, multi-hop IPBFD? I have not read your draft, so maybe you have a lot more than just a liveliness check. But it seems like you are also um, propagating the failure check based on whoever has registered. Like, for instance, A has also registered to be notified if the C has gone down. Is that even though the session is between A and B, liveliness check? Uh, again, A is registering to get a uh, loopback update uptime or updates for the entire network. So yes, he's get going to get re uh, notifications about B, C, and D. I see. Okay. So I, I, I so originally I was asking if multi-hop IPBFD for liveliness check work, but I think you have a lot more here than what I was thinking. I'm, okay, I'm not trying to, to compete with BFD here. Yeah, right. That has been proposed as one of the solutions, but it wasn't. It wasn't what people were happy with. Uh, okay, the last. Spurt. So, Tony, you know, I'm on record as not liking this solution. I'm not going to rehash this. Uh, I have a Thank different. You. I have a different question for you. Um, you're inventing a new uh, application or service, if you will which operators are going to have to configure and maintain and troubleshoot. 
And the source of all this information comes from the IDPs that they're already running and know how to uh, configure and manage and so forth. Do you have any feedback from operators as to how they feel about this? Are they are they interested? Are they scared of it? Are they, is, is, do they have anything to share? Um, I've heard some feedback from one operator. Um, I, I, he's, I believe in the room. Uh, I will not speak for him. Uh, so, um, but no, other than that, I have not heard a lot of feedback. I will point out that routers have lots and lots of subsystems, lots and lots of different things that people have to configure. Um, one more, I agree, is a pain, but frankly, adding one more mechanism to our architecture is much better in my mind than overloading dozens and dozens of things onto one protocol. All right, I guess the, the only point I wanted to make is you and I might agree or disagree, but if nobody wants to deploy this, then it's kind of moot. So I'm really interested yeah. to, to find out. It's how one alternative feel. for PUA, and if people feel that PUA or one of, you know, somehow we have to come to some solution for PUA problems. Agreed. Okay, I, I will be on time. We're still okay on time. So, um, uh, AC? AC, you're, you were going to say something about messing up OSPF, I'm sure. AC and the Cisco systems. Uh, thanks. Speaking as working group members, thanks for a very readable draft. It was very easy to easy to read th through this. Uh, the, the, the thing I was going to point out is I realize it's not limited to this, but if, if you put all your loopbacks in one hierarchical pre prefix, I'm going to go on the record as saying I don't think 10, 20,000 uh, uh, advertisements of loopbacks in OSPF is that many. I don't really, I really don't think, especially be, maybe because because they're real small, you know, they're little small LSAs. It's not a big deal that you have these and the granularity, and if they don't, they're not, they, they don't go up and down that often. You know, it's not, it's not that's not a big deal to me. So if you put them all in a separate prefix anyway, you could just not summarize those. That would be my first comment. My other one: How did you come up with O and N for? IPv4 and IPv6. That's just, I was just curious where you got those from. Is that Latin or something? Uh, that's old and new. Ah, OK. I should have gotten that. Thanks. And the reason right. for ag aggregating things into a prefix was to allow us to minimize the number of registration me messages flying around. No, I, I yeah, realize that. You know, you're going to go, notify... go through that administrative burden anyway. I, I, I'm just saying, at least for OSPF, I don't see a problem with, with tens of thousands of advertisements. Okay. The, the notification is on a is on a is on a host level, right? You register for interest in a in a prefix, you get notified of of sing, single. Correct. Deads. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, is it Zhao? Yeah, Jeffrey from Juniper. Uh, Jeff, see the. Sorry. When I see the registration and notification, the, the sequence of events, and especially from one area to another propagation, reminds me of the BGP's uh, route target constraint mechanism. I thought I'd just make that comment. Okay, I was not consciously mirroring that. Oh, um, I didn't mean that you were mirroring either. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, one more. Uh, guy, uh, quick now, though. We're almost out of time. And Tony, you know, on the. Uh, do you guys hear an echo? Sorry, I didn't think there was a bad echo. Um, with, with the uh, over, and on the uh, mailing list, I had mentioned that there is. Uh, overhead are there any concerns with overhead related to um, maintaining i guess the sections i guess between the different um, elements that are that are participating in this? Um, I, I, I'm, 
I don't have a whole lot of concerns about it. That's not a whole lot of data um, in the modern large scale network. And because we can take it off the ABR, it doesn't even have to be router based. So, you know, take, take standard commercial server instance, drop it somewhere. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Tony. Uh, next stop. G, um, IGP extensions for scalable segment routing based enhanced. And I need to click mute all. Okay, uh, G, you may need to, I just muted everyone, so you may need to unmute yourself again. Sorry. Okay, great. I see you. And I'm going to give you. I'm going to select the slide this time. It's enhanced VPN. Yes. And then, oh, that's interesting. Okay, I'm going to give you the control, and you may have to. You might need to select your your deck out of there. Oh. Okay. Should be number four. Number four. Yes. Just click on that and you'll get you'll get control. Yeah. Can you see it now? Can you see yes. the slides now? Yep. Okay. So uh, hello everyone, this is Jedong from Huawei. I'm going to give an update about uh, the IGP extensions for the scalable second routing based enhanced VPN or Core VPN Plus. I'm present, presenting here on behalf of all the co-authors listed on the front page. Okay. So here are some backgrounds. The VPN Plus framework is a, described in the enhanced VPN draft in TIS, and it mentions that one typical use case is to deliver the ITF network slice service. And the ITF network slice framework is this described in the ITF network slice draft. Uh, it introduced the concept called a uh, network resource partition or NRP for the network slice realization. So in the context of network slicing, we can consider the NRP as an instantiation of the VTN defined in the VPN plus framework. Then the scalability of the NRP is uh, something G consider. G one second. Okay. I, uh, I'm seeing in the chat room, apparently there's no sound. Can, uh, I mean, I'm hearing you. Uh, I think everyone remote is hearing you, but I don't think anybody in the room. Unfortunately, everyone in the room accounts for three people. <laughs> so, uh, people in the room cannot hear me. Yeah, but I'm not sure we should hold the entire meeting up for for three people. I, so uh, let's uh, at least. But they can. Their personal devices. What was that, John? Not in the room. Uh, I, I was saying, yeah. um, let's if we're going to continue, then let's at least tell them we're going to do that so that they have the opportunity to join from their laptops. Well, uh, let's give them maybe thirty seconds. I, we are we were already a little bit a minute late, so. Right. Uh, this is exactly the uh, the symmetrical case of um, you know in, in a quote normal meeting unquote when the few <laughs> people can <laughs> hear. Either yeah. way, we we sh the, you know the to the extent size possible, size we should be respectful of everyone. Yeah. yeah. I, the, our delegate has left the table. <laughs> Maybe he's going to go. <laughs> Pound is our uh, oh, phone drink. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let them know that we're going to move forward. Uh, oh, John, looks like you are right now. Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to. Let's let's keep moving forward. Go. Um, go ahead, G. Keep Shall going. Shall I continue? Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, I just mentioned that uh, the scalability of the NRP is analyzed in the TIS 
graft NRP scalability, and that draft provides guidelines for the control plan and data plane optimizations to improve the scalability for the NRP. So this document defines the mechanisms for IGP uh, to distribute the uh, status and information for the uh, NRPs uh, or VTNs in a scalable manner. Uh, So here is uh, the summary about the optimizations for the better scalability. Uh, the first uh, thing we can do is we can map multiple overlay connectivity services to the same VTN, so that we can use the one shared VTN to provide the underlying network uh, topology and resource re attributes required by a group of the overlay services. And the second point is we can decouple the topology and the resource attribute of a VTN so that uh, we can allow multiple VTNs to share the same topology and the, also the topology specific uh, route computation so that the overhead in the control plane can be re, uh, reduced. Uh, we can also allow multiple VTNs to share the same set of network resources on some of the network segments. This brings uh, flexibility in the resource isolation or sharing. And the third one is we can introduce a network-wide uh, VTN ID in the data plane so that we can avoid allocation of uh, and the distribution of additional per VTN segments for the SR-based VPN plus. Um, note that we are in the progress of a align to align the terminology of VTN and NRP uh, in a set of documents. So here we just uh, keep using the VTN in the following slides. Okay, so here are the extensions to the ISS. Um, first is uh, we defined a new uh, VTN definition sub TLV. It is used to advertise the associated topology and uh, uh, other attributes of the VTN. Uh, and it can be used uh, under the ISS router capability TLV. So the format is shown here. Basically, it contains uh, the VTN ID, which is uh, network wide and an MT ID to identify the topology associated with the VTN and algorithm ID to identify the algorithm uh, associated, which can be a normal algorithm or a flux algorithm. There are also the fields for the future uh, extension to sub sub TRVs can be used uh, to uh, add additional attributes of the VTN. Uh, for the topology advertisement, as we mentioned, uh, the multiple VTNs can share the same topology so that uh, we can reuse the existing mechanism like IGP multi-topology or flux algo to define the topology of the VTN and the distributed attributes of the uh, topology. Here, multi-topology can be reused to define the logical topology and also the per-topology node and the link attributes. Then flux algo can be used to specify the metric type and the topology constraints, which are applied on the, a specific topology. Uh, note that uh, multiple VTNs can be associated with the same topology algorithm topo. Uh, for the segment routing, the extensions uh, in uh, IGP protocols can also provide the distribution of their per topology algorithm tuples, SRCs, and SRV6 locators. Uh, the second part is uh, about the advertisement of the VTN resource attributes. Here we introduce two options. Uh, the first one is to, re, uh, to use the IGP L2 bundle mechanism with some minor extensions. Uh, here we uh, treat the subset of the link resources uh, allocated to a VTN as a, either a physical or virtual layer 2 member link of the layer 3 link. And using the L2 bundle mechanism, we introduce a, a new flag called uh, E flag. It is used to indicate whether uh, the member links can be used for load balancing or each member link is used ex exclusively for the associated VTNs. Then we also introduce a new VTN ID sub TLV to specify the association between the layer two member link and a set of uh, VTNs. So basically, there's a list of the VTN IDs in this uh, sub TLV. Uh, the second approach for the resource attribute advertisement is to 
introduced provision link te attributes so that a subset of linked resources allocated to a vtn can be modeled as a provision te attributes of the link here we need to introduce a new sub tlv to define uh, to advertise the set of uh, link resource and the other t attributes for uh, one or a group of vtns here the VTN ID sub sub TLV is used to uh, specify the list of VTN IDs and other sub sub TLVs can include the T attribute sub TLVs like the VTN bandwidth sub TLV, other the T attributes which are associated with uh, a set of VTNs. Uh, the third part is to advertise the VTN specific data plane identifiers uh, so that we can generate the forwarding entries for different VTNs. The first option is we can introduce per VTN SRCs or SRV6 locators. So here we list a, a set of the new sub TLVs or TLVs for this purpose. Uh, the second we, approach is, as I mentioned slide? in the beginning, I'm sorry, but we're out of time. Uh, on one, one more has asked for. Okay, this is, I think, the last, uh, um, yeah. almost the last one. Yeah, the uh, op second option is to use the dedicated VTN ID instead, so we can uh, save this overhead of the control plane distribution. Okay, here's the next step. Uh, we will work on the terminology alignment, and uh, we would like to hear comments, feedbacks from the working group. Then we consider adoption of this document. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the reason I was I was trying to cut you short a little bit was because I wanted to give a little bit of time to discuss this. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll throw my comments out since I get to. Um, and that is that right now, the we're looking at a standards track modification to the protocol based on informational. They have, you, you are basing part of this on adopted drafts and T's but they're adopted as informational. I think we want to see that, you know, and I, I talked to Lou Berger and you know, he, he seems to think that there, there's still a little bit more work to be done in, on this. Plus there's one other draft that you referred to, I believe that is an individual draft. So I think it's a little early to be talking about adoption in this working group. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not saying that, that I'm, not, I'm not trying to personally cut it down and I'm speaking as a chair right now, right? I, I think it's just, you know, we need to like move it the right or in the right order and at the right pace. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, a clarification: which document are you talking about in the TS working group? The I, I think one? You normatively, you normatively reference the two informational ones, and you informatively reference the personal. I don't. I don't remember them. You, you must know hey, what they are, right? What, hey, are hey, you saying hey, I hey, got hey, it wrong? Chris, the, 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 one of the chairs of the T's is in the queue. Oh, okay. Yes. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Go ahead. Tariq, go ahead, and then. Uh, okay. Bob. Can you hear me? Uh, hello, this is Tarek. Uh, Hi, Derek. Uh, oh, you can hear me. Great. Uh, thanks, Jimmy, for the presentation. Uh, it's not a question. I just want to um, draw your attention that we have proposed um, uh, similar extensions in the LSR working group um, um, for per, per NRP uh, sets as well as uh, uh, per, uh, per NRP link attributes. Uh, there are at least two drafts that we presented, uh, one of them back in IETF 110. Um, so I agree with Chris. Uh, we need to still, it's the, 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 you know, what you're proposing is it's early for adoption at the moment. Maybe we should collaborate and uh, complete the alignment. As you mentioned, uh, you still reference VTN when he has already uh, converged on the term NRP. So that, that's what uh, I wanted to draw your attention to. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Hey. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, this this Pawan uh, earlier I was on mute earlier. Um, speaking as the ch as the T's working group chair, uh, you're right. We have had some discussion with regards to VTN versus NRP in the T's working group. Uh, the guidance from the T's chairs at this point uh, is to use the term NRP in documents that 
uh, discuss generic usage of resource partitions and refer to VTN in only in documents that are specific to enhance VPN. So if there are any protocol fields or data model leaves that you need to refer to uh, and identify for resource partition, uh, the expectation is that you would use NR NRPID in those scenarios. So uh, we would have to, we may end up looking at each document in the space across working groups and make a call, but uh, that's the guidance for now. Uh, then this document seems to be a good candidate where NRP uh, should be used. Okay, great. Okay. I think we need to do yeah, the next, We are uh, working on the alignment. Okay, great. So thanks. Yeah. All right. So next up is uh, Wimo. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you control. Uh, pull your slides up. If you can pull yours in and not take the full 15, that would be great. Do you see? Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the uh, LSR for SR proxy forwarding. There is a draft about the proxy forwarding for SRT pass protection. So this draft contains IGP extension and provides protection of node and bounding seeds of a failed node. We have presented this draft in Spring Working Group many times, and we received lots of value comments and suggestions from Bruno, AC, Peter, and Les. Just before the working group adoption for this draft, uh, we were suggested to move the IGP extension to a new draft. So that's the new draft I'm going to present focusing on IGP extensions. There are two sets of extensions. One set is for advertising bounding segments. The other is for advertising proxy forwarding capabilities. A bounding segment consists of a bounding seat and a list of segments. A node may have multiple bounding segments. That node will advertise its bounding segments to its neighbors. For advertising proxy forwarding capability, a node P, if P has the capability for P's labels, P will advertise the capability in the domain. There are two options for a node P to advertise its capabilities. One option is that P, in order to provide protection, node P may use mirror ID for its label N. Node P will advertise mirror ID for node N for protection. So in this case, we can just use mirror ID as an indication of the capability. So another option is that node P just use one flag, PF flag, which is short for proxy forwarding, just advertise this bit in, in the domain. For advertising bounding segments in OSPF, a node N will use a bounding, a bounding segment TLV for each of its bounding segments in a link scope OPEC LSAs. A bounding, TL, a bounding segment TLV will contain a bounding seed and a list of seeds for the list of segments. So similarly, similarly for uh, ISIS, so ISIS where no, when node N has a number of bounding segments, node N will advertise each of the bounding segments using a bounding 
segment TLV in a link scope LSPs. So this TLV is, is similar to OSPF, just contain binding seed and the list of segments or list of seeds. So for advertising proxy forwarding capability in OSPF, we just need one bit, which is defined in the existing router function capability TLV. So just one bit, which is a PF bit, bit so set to one, indicated the capability, and then it applies this one. So similarly, in, OSP, in, IS, in SIS, so we just define a new flag in the existing SR capability sub TLV. So this new flag will indicate whether node P have the proxy forwarding capabilities. Yeah, I think that that's all. And then I would like to receive comments. So uh, Wemo, it's, uh, this, this is me uh, speaking as a chair. Uh, I'm not mistaken, the, the proxy stuff in spring is, is not adopted yet, is that correct? Uh, they, I don't know, because just before the IETF, we uh, have an adoption call, and then that's uh, depend on the chair's decisions, whether they will adopt it or not. I think the, the uh, from my understanding, we I think we receive a good amount of support, and then that's depends on yeah. Uh, uh, Bruno is so, here. So you it you expect on... it, but it isn't done yet. So, yeah, yeah, so it's not it's not announced yet. I don't know the decision from chair yet. <laughs> right, right. So I mean, I think this is the same comment I gave to the last presenter. Uh, you know, these obviously come after the base document would be adopted. I, I mean, you're not even asking for adoption here, so. I just thought I would put that out there. You know, we'll probably follow along behind the base document. Um, Bruno, 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 Bruno can go. Bruno, Bruno can go ahead. Yeah, me. yeah, go ahead, Bruno. Uh, Bruno was a spring co-chair, so we we started the code for adoption about a, a month or, or two ago, and I believe we sent the result. Uh, at least I sent it somewhere. And um, the, in short, the result is that there is some support for the feature but not for the to propose IGP extensions. So oh, I can... so in other words, you, you didn't you you think it would have been adopted without the IGP extensions in it? No, 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 no. Um, well, actually, there are two two subjects. Um, uh, so one is different. Regarding that one, uh, one of the comments is that uh, it is functionally equivalent to the. Um, I don't remember the name. In the ISIS binding seed, we have uh, some kind of anycast, uh, which is mirror seed. We have mirror seed in um, existing in ISIS as our extension. And it seems uh, proxy forwarding seems functionally equivalent. So the question uh, was why do we need a new IGP extension instead of reusing uh, the, the mirror seed, at least for ISIS? For us, yeah, I'm not following. Uh, so closely. So is this an end run then? <laughs> you, you guys said we don't like the, I, I, the ISIS extension uh, and Wemo brought it here to see if we like the ISIS extension? Is that, is that what happened? The function we need is, uh, they need uh, is uh, a router advertise, need to advertise that it is a proxy for someone else. Uh, there was common on the list that uh, the function already exists. It's a mirror okay. seed, which is defined in uh, SR architecture, and which is also defined in ISIS, SR extension, which is uh, two or three years ago. So the feedback from the working group that is that why do we need a new IGP extension, at least for ISIS, okay. to provide that uh, proxy forwarding uh, feature? And I don't think we made progress since then. Okay. Wimo, do you have a... Yeah, I think this, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, there are two options here. One uh, option is that we can uh, reuse the mirror sheet already there. In this case, we don't need any extensions, at least for SIS. And then we have another options, just uh, one bit for uh, capability. 
Okay. Uh, Stefan? And I think for the uh, extension for binding segments, we need, uh, in order to support the binding segment of a failed node, and then this uh, binding segment advertisement should be nice to have. Otherwise, we need to configure or <laughs> do something else. I'm sorry, AC, do you want to go? Yeah, AC Lindum, Cisco Systems, speaking as working group member. I, I think the document, you know, you know, even, even irrespective of the issue that Bruno brought up, it could be a lot clearer as to who advertises what, you know, the failed mode and when they advertise it in relation to the failure, the duration and everything. Um, I really, uh, I, even though I'd seen this before, I really had to go to the spring document. Then I had to actually, the spring document didn't help me until I looked at the example. You know, you can kind of guess, you can kind of guess how it would work, but it should specify exactly when the capabilities are at, advertised and uh for how long and then you should advertise i mean because there was a there was a uh implying that it was only for a certain period of time or something it wasn't all and i thought wow i think you'd tell i thought you'd tell the the no you were protecting you'd tell it as soon as the adjacency came up but anyway i think that needs to be added to the draft okay thank you yeah yes yes okay Okay. Uh, so yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. I had some issue with uh, with Miko. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. No, I I just wanted to uh, to highlight again and what what Bruno mentioned. Uh, in fact, there was some uh, some disagreement also on uh, on the way of doing it because the draft, at least as the way it was. Uh, um uh, when the adoption call was done in um, in spring was proposing to uh, uh to, to for to for instance advertise this capability uh, just for a couple of neighbors but in this case this is creating some uh, uh potentially some uh, an optimality or path or, or issues and so on so so there was also some disagreement on the way of uh, of doing it so so the fact is really we need to clarify the use case first and the way we should do things from an architecture point of view before talking about any IGP extension. So this has to be solved in spring before okay. doing anything in LSR, in my opinion. Yeah, I think uh, okay, for great. the capability is very clear. That's a normal practice, right? We when we have a capability in some routes and then uh, route routers and then some uh, nodes that don't have that capability, and then we need to have some kind of incremental deployment and also we have uh, backward compatibility. That's more more practice to improve the network uh, stability, right? And I'll also, I reply that one in the Spring Working Group. Okay, we 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 are out of time, and we don't need to have a Spring argument in our group. So yeah. <laughs> you have to convince the people over there first. Uh, but you know, I mean, if you if you can do that, I don't think you'll see a big a big anybody really objecting here. So yeah, I think okay. basically I, I, I would say. Okay. The objection, um, most objection is a computer, uh, a compete, competitive uh, draft, the author of another draft. That, that's that's it. Okay. So, so I know. Just so there's a, yeah, another draft. You, you, there's another, draft. Right. I got you. All right. Thank you, Remo. Okay. Thank uh, you. Shaku. Three minutes late here. And let me give you permissions. Just you should be able to select your slide deck. Uh, okay. Let me see. What? Oh, okay. I found it. Great. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. All. Now I will introduce the scheme about the IGP deterministic routing. <coughs> Sorry, there's a bit of latency. Hear you. Yeah, I'm here, but I can't see the green. 
the slide too. It's motiv uh, so motivation. This, it's, uh, yeah, this is the motivations. Uh, the architecture defines the course goals of determining the routine, uh, bounded uh, delegated, uh, bounded packet loss ratio, and uh, bounded out of order delivery. Uh, it uses resource reservation, explicit routing, and uh, <coughs> service protection to achieve these goals. A uh, deterministic path is typically, but not necessarily, a uh, traffic engineer path with uh, explicit routing calculated by a controller. Uh, for the cycle, provides an alternate way to compute the constraint based path. So, we propose a distributed deterministic. Uh, Routing extensions for for the cycle. So next, oh, the latency is a bit. Yeah, okay, this up. is uh, for uh for the cycle. Yeah, gaps. Uh, the latency is a bit. A uh, first cycle already supports the mean delay metric type that uh, considers linked delay. But not the node delay, including two delays. Delay equals to node delay plus link transmission delay. To obtain a deterministic path, the node delay must be considered. Uh, some example is that uh, a link of from 1 to 10 kilometers in length and from 5 to 50 microseconds in transmission delay. And uh, the node delay may be from 10 to 50 microseconds. So next. How? Oh. Yeah, how? So how to provide the flux cycle deterministic uh, routing? Uh, uh, three aspects are considered under the guidance of the net architecture for the resource reservation aspect. Uh, deterministic link is introduced, which has the deterministic node delay attributes. For the explicit routing aspect, uh, we introduce a flux arc pass calculated with deterministic delay metric type. For the service protection aspect, an additional redundant deterministic delay pass uh, consistent with the delay of the primary pass is uh, computed. So next. Deterministic link attributes advertised. Yeah, but uh, I just the way that the screen to present. It's, okay. it's updated to everybody uh, else. Don't worry. That is a deterministic link attribute. Okay. Uh, uh, this page is about the deterministic link attributes advertised, uh, including link transmission delay. That means the average measured link transmission delay value. Internal forwarding delay. That means the latency of a packet from reception and incoming port all generated from control play to queue and outgoing port. Uh, internal scheduling delay. That means the uh, related to the scheduling algorithm such as TSN CGF, deadline, CBS. Uh, multiple scheduling delays may be provided by each scheduling algorithm. Uh, the following figure shows the simplified delay model including three types of delay described above. So next. Okay. Uh, this page is about uh, how to compute the deterministic delay path. Uh, uh, FAD explicitly contains the deterministic link resource and a uh, scheduling delay. A new metric type, deterministic delay metric type, is used to indicate the calculation of deterministic delay path. Uh, the following figure illustrates an example of deterministic delay routing. Uh, in the physical network, deterministic links are generated and the attributes provided by these links are 
uh, node forwarding delay, five microseconds into node scheduling delay from one to 60 microseconds and link uh, transmission delay as indicated in the figure. Then full cycle 128 is created to include these deterministic links and band the scheduling delay 10 microseconds. So at the last, the deterministic SPT is shown on the right side. It has the deterministic delay and the delay jitter. From, for comparison, the traditional SPT based on the metric type one is shown on the left side. So next. So it is a bit of latest. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this page is about the re redundant deterministic delay pass. Redundant deterministic delay paths are calculated by TLR according to local policy, somewhat like TILF alpha pass, but not identical. Uh, the constraints for a uh, redundant pass including that are contained in the FAD. And uh, that constrained uh, the, the, the number of nodes intersecting the primary and the redundant pass is minimized. And uh, the constraint that uh, the difference between the number of hopes of a primary and the redundant pass is minimized. And uh, the constraint that uh, the difference between the cumulative link transmission delay of primary and the redundant pass is minimized. Uh, the primary and the redundant pass each use specific scheduling delays and should have similar cumulative delays. The packet is sent along the primary and the redundant pass at the same time. So next. Okay, uh, that is what the presentation of this document. Uh, any questions and comments are welcome. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, we uh, maybe come some quick comments. We're already over time, so we'd like to pull this in. Um, so I'm going to lock the queue now. Uh, the granularity of measurement doesn't match. The advertisement is per topology, per adjacency. The delay is per traffic class. You cannot advertise one per traffic class. In especially in VOQ system, there's huge difference between different traffic classes and the way they define so. I'm not sure how you can do it. Uh, so your question is about the measurement value is a uh, traffic class, right? So potentially all traffic classes will go into the same topology, right? but the time it takes to traverse the device is different and depends on traffic class definition. Okay. Um, let's move to the next question. You can also, unless you wanna answer that. Okay, next question. next question. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, Xiu Song from Huawei. Uh, one comment for this document, a uh, stable pass is very important for deterministic latency, which is called uh, explicit pass in that networking group. So I think um, we should be very careful if we choose a distributed pass computation mechanisms for that net, because if the pass change, the, the latency and the jitter will also change accordingly. So maybe we should have more discussion to uh, to uh, to decide whether we should go this way, especially using FlexEgle. Thank you. Thanks, Roshan. Uh, AC? Uh, speaking as working with chair, I think we're, we, we really should get yeah, input before we do anything on this from the, uh, the uh, DetNet working group as well. The one comment, I think you, one thing you needed is a discussion of the how often you change these things and how often you advertise them because i must admit i'm not uh i'm not an expert but it looked like it looked like these these nodal delays uh could change quite a bit and i think it, you know just for the the scaling and the and the hysteresis of uh 
of select path selection, there needs to be a discussion of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, so let's move to the next presentation. I think uh, it's interesting stuff, though, uh, especially what Joe Chong's point was. I wonder how that will all work out, but to be discussed, I guess. All right, who's up next? Uh, dedicated metric, is that right? Yeah, dedicated metric for flex algo. Then Xiao. Thanks, Xiaofi. Meng Zhao, you should uh, have be able to select your deck from the list. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, We're five minutes uh, over, so if you can pull this in, that'd be great. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Meng Xiao Chen from New H3C Technologies. This presentation is on adv uh, adv advertisement of dedicated metric for flexible algorithm in IGP. This is a 00 version individual draft. By the way, the words in the title dedicated metric for flexible algorithm may bring confusions. So we will use uh, algorithm specific link metric in the slides and the future version of the draft. Thanks for the comments from AC and IGN. Okay, uh, this is a background of this draft. Flex algorithm allows IGP to compute constraint-based passes. Links can be pruned by using EAG rules to create different topologies for different algorithms. However, if a link is included by multiple algorithms of the same metric type, these algorithms can only share the same metric value. The current defined flexible algorithm prefix metric sub tier V in the draft of flex algorithm can advertise algorithm specific prefix metric, but not for link metric. This draft extends EZs and OSPF to advertise uh, algorithm specific link metrics for different flex algorithms separately. Uh, here is the problem. Assume that in the network compromised by uh, node A, B, C, and D, we have two network slices for the traffic from A to D. For slice one, the network operator expects to use A, B, D as the primary path, and A, C, D is as a backup path. For slice two, A, C, D is the primary path, and A, B, D is a backup path. Network resources are reserved along the primary passes for slices. For example, on link AB and BD, bandwidth of 100 Mbps is reserved for slice one. And on link AC and CD, bandwidth is reserved for slice two. On the backup path, no dedicated resources are reserved and the bandwidth will be shared with the best effort traffics. Flex algorithm 128 is used to steal the traffic of slice 1, and the flex algorithm 129 is used for slice 2. Locators and seeds belonging to these flex algorithms are all resource aware. When processing the packets, resources identified by the locators and the seeds will be used. In the past comp computation of each flex algorithm, the intended primary path should be the shortest path from A to D. Unfortunately, if the metric type of the two flex algorithms are the same, which is possible since they both care about the bandwidth resources, same link metrics will be used in the computation of the two flex algorithms, and the path will be the same. Uh, if we use EAG rules, for example, link AB and BD are green and they are included by flex algorithm 128. Link AC and CD are yellow, included by flex algorithm 129. The primary passes of the two slices can be satisfied. But meanwhile, the backup pass will be excluded. It is not desirable. We hope that different metrics can be advertised for the same link. 
for flex algorithm 128, it is expected that matrix of link AB and BD others are smaller than link AC and CD. But for flex algorithm 129, link AC and CD will have smaller matrix. So in this draft, we want to advertise algorithm specific link matrix. Uh, do, you, uh, Tony, do you know if Tony puts a question here, or do you want to wait till the end? Okay. Go ahead, Tony. It's okay. Yep. Oh. <laughs> okay, Tony. Does it seem? It seems like you're maybe. Popping in and out. Uh, go ahead, Ming Zhao. Keep going forward. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, uh, here is another case uh, which can also benefit from the from the algorithm specific link matrix. Assume that there is a T tunnel between A and D in flex algorithm 128, but for the best effort traffics of default topology. Tunnel AD is not expected to be used. The metric type of flex algorithm 128 is IGP metric. In this case, we can advertise the link metric of tunnel AD with max metric. Meanwhile, algorithm specific link metric is also advertised for algorithm 128, and the metric is a smaller value, uh, which allows uh, uh, traffic to be stilled into the tunnel. Uh, this is the extension of algorithm specific link matrix sub tier V for EZs. It is carried in the application specific link attribute for flex algorithm. If the metric type and algorithm fields are consistent with uh, FAD, uh, set flex algorithm should use a metric in the new defined sub tier V during pass calculation. The new defined sub tier V is optional. If it is not advertised, legacy metrics are used. For example, uh, if the metric type of a flex algorithm is IGP metric and uh, the algorithm specific link metric sub tier V of the same metric type and algorithm is advertised in ASL carried by TRV22. The metric in the new defined sub TRV should be used other than the default metric field in TRV22. This is the extension for OSPF. The new sub TRV for OSPF is also carried in the application specific link attribute for flex algorithm. The usage is similar with EZEs. Uh, the next step is to request further review and the feedback. Any questions or comments are welcomed. Thank you. Okay, we have three three in the queue right now. I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll lock it after G for. We do need to move quick, so please go quick. I think that means I'm up. Uh, yes. So. Uh, Shraddha already brought this up on the mailing list, but I think that you you misunderstood her. Maybe. Um, we already have this in the generic metric that we've proposed. If you take a look at the flex algo definition, there's already a metric type that it defines, and it allows user-defined metric types. And then you can attach a metric type to a metric on a link. And that is all you needed. So we already have this mechanism. It's redundant with the other uh, generic metric proposal. Please take a look again. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, but I think uh, the metric type based metric uh, is different from the algorithm based metric. Uh, so our, our problem here is to use different link metric value for same metric type, uh, but different flex algo. Uh, using multiple user defined metric type may be a solution that can avoid our problem. But I'm I'm afraid that it may bring complexity uh, in the same time, uh, as we need to define uh, many private uh, metric types for every flex algorithm and uh, advertise them for every link. Uh, so, 
uh, I think uh, uh, we gotta we gotta can move forward. I, can, can uh, okay. Next question, you. please, or comment. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, I have one comment and one question. The question is: If there are losers that do not support this mechanism in the network, we now defining a new metric type. How to ensure that no loop occurs during root calculation? Okay. One comment is uh, the existing flex echo mechanism can also solve the scenario in the document. I suggest that the metric type can be defined into two scopes, general and custom, and customize the metric type within the customized scope for the special flex echo. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, we're gonna, Peter. Can you make your point? I, I we're we're way over now. I, I'm gonna. I, I want to give everyone a chance, but I don't think we have time. So, Peter, do you have a comment, really quick? You may be muted locally. You gotta unmute. Okay. Time's up. G, go ahead, G. I go more and more similar to the multi topology, and uh, this is not uh, the uh, original design of the how flash algo is used and work. Yeah. Okay. Nice comment. Thank you. Uh, we have to move on now. Uh, sorry, everyone. Um, so next up is Shrada, the application specific link attribute. This one may generate some commentary. That's why I've been kind of pushing people. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Shrada. If you can pull the presentation in, we we have 15 minutes allocated here. So if you could get it done quicker, we'll have more time for discussion. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I got to give you permission. Hang on. There, you should have permission to select your slides. Yeah, I'm going to be presenting the um, uh, extension to ASLA with any application bit on behalf of my co-authors. A quick recap of the problem statement, and then uh, we have uh, an example to show uh, where this is, uh, any bit is uh, beneficial. So a network operator may want certain link attributes uh, to be used by all current applications and all future applications. The design of those attributes may be such that uh, uh, they have to be used, same value has to be used for all, all uh, different mechanisms uh, such as SRT, FlexAlgo, and RSVP that are deployed in the network. So ASLA allows for attribute advertisement where link attributes are uh, applicable to one application or some applications. And there's a limited provision to advertise attributes that are applicable to any application that is currently defined or going to be defined in future. It's limited because um, it says um, uh, it do does not allow application to use attributes from zero length uh, bit mask when any other attribute is advertised with an application bit set. So what we're trying to solve here is provide more granular control over attribute advertisement for any application versus specific application. So what we are proposing is a new bit uh, under uh, the applications uh, application bits, which is called A bit, which means any application can use attributes which are advertised under this uh, bit mask. So an ex example use case here. So let's consider a network deployment uh, that has deployed below attributes, right? So admin groups, SRLG, T metric, and generic metric, and many other attributes. So they have no application specific values. Uh, so all deployed applications are all using same values for all these applications. So a new application is defined, uh, let's say, 
as part of network evolution, a new application Y is, uh, is um, to be deployed. And it uses a specific value for one of the attributes. So I had taken the sub TLB 10 and less pointed out that that's not the right example. So let's let's just take one of the attributes, maybe admin groups that it, it has to use an application specific value. Using uh, any bit, the way we would advertise is, so, so to start with the um, uh, network would have uh, advertised all those attributes under any app any bit set with SABM with any bit set. And when the new application is introduced with some uh, uh, application that has a application specific value for certain attribute, we would just um, set, um, uh, advertise a new ASLA sub TLV uh, with uh, any bit, uh, with a Y bit set. And then uh, uh, we would advertise the attribute that requires specific value. The previous advertisement would remain same, no change uh, the to the previous ASLA sub -tier. So can this be achieved with existing RFC 8919? Yes, it can be achieved, and this shows how that can be achieved. There are multiple ways this can be achieved. So one option is um, um, the moment you advertise, because um, you, you can advertise with SABM zero length, which means um, all any application can use it. So um, to start with, you would be advertising with uh, zero uh, bit mask and then all the attributes. And then when the new at, uh, at application has to be introduced, uh, you would uh, advertise another SLA sub TLV, set the Y bit, the, which is the new application, and then add the sub TLV that has application specific value. You would, all, you would also have to repeat all other, because that application also wants to use all other attributes. So you would have to repeat all other attributes under this SLA sub TLV as well. So this option is uh, not very efficient in coding. You can see that all the uh, attributes are being repeated. So there is another way of advertising the same with um, SAB, uh, I mean, existing RFC 8919, where, wherein uh, there are three ASLA sub TLVs. The first one where all bits are, all application bits are set except Y, and then you advertise the um, uh, attribute uh, that Y chose to have application specific value. And then your existing ASLA sub TLV, you put all other attributes, but remove the one which has the application specific value. And then a third ASLA sub TLV where a Y bit is set. And then application specific value for that sub TLV is uh, included. So um, option two is better uh, encoding efficiency as compared to the previous option, uh, but not as efficient as uh, uh, any app or way of advertising. Uh, so, and also um, what, what we're suggesting is that it's the, it's an efficient encoding, and uh, it's very intuitive encoding when um, there are attributes that have application-specific values and um, some attributes that don't have application spe that have specific application-specific values and other attributes that um, do not have application-specific uh, values. And it's it's uh, intuitive encoding as well as very straightforward to implement. Yeah, before we go there, so Les also made a comment that, uh, uh, you know, ex existing deployments that have already deployed ASLA, uh, you know, moving them to this would be uh, problematic. So th there is no need for, because ASLA ensures, uh, I mean, any bit ensures that um, if, if there is an advertisement with uh, uh, of course, if, if you want to deploy uh, this um, uh, ASLA with any bit, so all the nodes in your uh, domain have to understand this any bit. Um, so an existing deployment that has um, already deployed um, ASLA uh, with existing mechanism, that, I mean, there is no uh, force, I mean, there is no enforcement to change to any application, right? They can do that whenever uh, the time comes. That is, when a new application comes in where it's more appropriate to use any, they can migrate during that time. There's no 
there's no uh, need to switch to any app uh, immediately. They can do that whenever there's really need for that. But those um, uh, deployments which are going to deploy S line future and they have the specific require. I mean, the, they they believe the their network is going to evolve the way described in these examples. They can go with uh, any bit um, if we if we pro if we allow this protocol extension. Uh, uh, for Asla. Okay. Uh, yeah, we would request go. review and comments and uh, working group adoption. Uh, sorry, let, let, let's go ahead. You're in the queue. So, uh, Shrad, as, as you've seen, uh, I mean, I sent a pretty lengthy uh, email uh, discussing uh, this. Uh, I, I don't won't go over it point by point. Um, you know, give you a chance to read it and respond. But the, you know, the, the conclusion on my part is uh, there's really no justification for moving this forward. There are no significant uh, advantages when you look at the spectrum of, of the various uh, combinations of, of cases, deployment cases. And there's a lot of cost in terms of implementation complexity and deployment complexity that comes along with this and we're really not getting any benefit for it so my my opinion is that there's just no justification to move forward with this okay uh so Les, i i i think you mentioned that uh in in terms of uh encoding efficiency there's very little that is getting saved but this example was just an example right you can imagine if there are more attributes um, that new application requires application specific values, all those uh, will have to be repeated in, in that option too that that I discussed. So, uh, well, I've I mean I went through three different examples with with varying combinations, and uh, you know the example you provided, there's some savings, and the other two examples, there's either no savings <laughs> or the all. Is, is slightly better. So uh, I really think the quantification of this efficiencies is, you know, even if you get a little bit, it's, it's very small and it's overwhelmed by the complexity that you're adding to implementations and to deployments. That's, that's my input. Um, so I, I joined the queue is with my chair hat off. So just speaking as working member, I'm, I find the lessons example is pretty convincing but even so if there were I mean I guess I it's coming down to whether you think this is needed or not and do we have any examples right now where this is needed you know are, are we is this just like imagining that we might need this that if we might have a bunch of applications someday if this would be a better way to encode it or is there a real pressing need for this? Do we have deployments that are currently running out of TLB space, for example? That, that would be my question. Uh, so, uh, Chris, this is so the comment that I have is if 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 um, if we are going to make Asla as a uh, going ahead, if we want to make that as a de facto standard where the link attributes have to be advertised, it has to be flexible and we have to let it evolve and we have to think of future where new applications can come and how easy it is the existing um, uh, extensions how easy it is uh, you know to uh, how easy and simple it is to understand and to you know advertise those um, uh, uh, attributes uh, in uh, inside this uh, asla sub tlv if we don't do that, if, if we don't allow such, um, uh, 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 you know, the protocol uh, extensions to evolve, then it's it's really difficult and really hard to justify making them de facto standards. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I wasn't saying don't, don't let it happen. I was just saying, I mean, we have like a we have an extension out there in ISIS, right, to use, you know, ex expanded space. We never used it. I just. That's all I meant. Since this is contentious, I just be nice. Yes. Yeah, so, Krish, some, some oh, so your for it, uh, you know from. Oh, okay. So your question: Do we have uh, cases where TLV space is exhausting? 
I think we have of another course. draft uh, which where which describes those scenarios uh, happening and uh, how that should be handled. Um, so, which which means that you know the TLE space uh, getting used up is 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 real. Yeah. Okay, I, that's a valid comment. All right, uh, Martin, uh, I think you're up next. Yeah, Martin Hornefer, Deutsche Telekom. Um, Oh, you're I don't very really quiet. have an argument pro or contra Schrader's uh, um, draft, uh, nor for less argument, just a Kitterum Kinseo on the uh, application specific link attributes in general. I think the fact that we have this kind of discussion shows that the concept of application specific link attributes is just too complex. I don't know who really needs it. I, from my point of view, it's overly complex, but here we are. I hope we resolve this issue or this discussion as soon as possible. Martin, I couldn't hear your comment at all. Would be helpful if you could send it on the list. Yeah, and also open up Cody MD if you don't mind and put it in the minutes. Uh, to the media echo people, it's, it's really hard to hear the in-room mic. It's, I've seen this in multiple working groups too. Okay, I can write with the list. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. All right. Um, I think that so. I, I, I was just going to encourage. Oh, AC, go ahead. This is just AC speaking as uh, chair. Just encourage everybody to uh, read through the email uh, email thread and comment on this. I was just in response to Martin, also speaking as working group chair. We did have operators that requested application specific attributes back in that discussion. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Shrada. Um, all right, Alvaro, Alvaro, and the OSPF monitor node on site. Hopefully, the mic is louder. <laughs> Jeffrey was trying to sneak in here and get his presentation on. So, um, I'm assuming you guys are going to share the slides. Yep. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I forgot you were on site. Hang on. Uh, yeah, I'm here. All right. Um, so uh, okay, I've got time. I've got it up. Oh, that's very weird. I I don't actually know how to do this locally. Do you see the slides? Nope. No. You should just do whatever you did before. We were seeing the other slides. <laughs> uh, Jeff, can you share them? I, I I was I was what he did before was give controls to the presenter. When I click on it, it just opens the document in my computer. Coming, it's coming now. Coming okay. soon. I'm sharing it. Oh. There we go. Okay, so I'm okay, uh, great. Thank Atlanta, you. and uh, I work at Futureway, and I'm doing this work with Lynn Han. Um, I had sent an email to the mailing list about this and there were some replies. Uh, sorry, I didn't get to the replies, but I'm going to uh, attempt and answer uh, the comments from there uh, today. I only have five slides. So please, uh, you know, hold all the other comments until I finish and hopefully address your, your slides uh, or your comments uh, next. So uh, what we're trying to do here is define what we call an active monitor active as opposed to what we usually have, which is a passive monitor, say on a LAN, which just listens. And most of the time we don't even know it's there. We have, um, and this is something that, that we left off the draft because we wanted it to be not specific to an application um, or the implementation, the deployment that we have, but uh, more general. So what we have, the, the specific application that we have is we have a mobile network and this mobile network is going to, from time to time, come in contact with what we're calling a, a monitor node over a point-to-point -point, uh, radio link. So it's very specific to a point-to-point -point, uh, implementation. What we want is, of course, to be able to um, interface with this node. We want to authenticate it. Uh, we want this node to be non-transit, as has been uh, pointed out on the list. But we also want the node to not be able to influence our network. Meaning if it decides to send stuff to us, right, to become not just listen only, but to send uh, LSAs or anything else, we want to be able to not propagate the LSAs across the rest of the network and also to not 
advertise the link that we're connected uh, towards this node. Um, this will also not only achieve uh, stability in the network, because if we're just flooding a bunch of LSAs, which may or may not be just the local LSAs for that monitor node, this node could inject you know, whatever they want. And we don't want that to create anything uh, inside the network. The same thing with the link. If the link flaps or anything else, uh, it could cause some stability in there. Um, this helps with that. It also helps with, of course, not having even traffic to the node, which many of the existing solutions allow, right? Not just no uh, transit traffic, but no traffic to the node itself. And we also wrote in the draft that uh, in the case of this being used in the multi-axis interface, that we don't want the node to become a DR or BDR. Um, I, I do realize when I was <laughs> doing the slides last night that we need to beef up a lot the description of what does it mean to not be eligible for DR and BDR. So we need to, to work on that. Uh, next slide. So what the draft says is it gives two options. One in section three that we call a monitoring interface. So basically we're defining two interface configurable parameters. Th these are you know, the same type that are defined in uh, 2328 and I think it's appendix C2 and uh, there are some in OSP 3 as well. So what these do is you know, relatively simple. Uh, the names are um, very straightforward. Do not advertise link, which means don't advertise the link. Um, where uh, you configure this, again, in our application, it's a point-to-point -point link, but it could also work in a multi-access link. And the other one is do not request and ignore LSAs. So in there, we describe a little bit more where we say, well, in this case, what we want you to do is to not request LSAs from the monitor node when you're doing the database exchange and don't uh, consider any uh, LSAs received from them for propagation. So section 13 of 2328 talks about how to do that with uh, max age. So what this lets us, do, lets us do is the goals that I mentioned before, you can authenticate the node, it won't be transit because there's no information going out from them. There's no direct traffic to them either. There's no LSA propagation. We're not advertising the link. And yes, we need to clarify a little bit more what does it mean to not be eligible for DR and BDR. Um, we think it's important for this to be specified or at least documented. It doesn't necessarily have to be a standard or documented uh, because at least in the scenario they're working on, there might be multiple routers at that edge of the network, multiple vendors, for example, that, um, could implement this and we want you know, to be the, the behavior to be clear and understood exactly what's going to happen not to leave it to chance for the one implementation to uh, do one thing different than another uh, next slide so uh, that first option you know, addresses the need that we have but we thought you know as long as we're doing this we should do a complete solution for a monitoring node so the other um, way of doing this is not just assume that the monitor node is the only one on the interface. But if we have, say, a LAN, we could have multiple routers and one of them, one of the nodes be a monitor node. So in this option, we're saying the monitor node would advertise a bit in uh, LLS saying, hey, I'm a monitor. And what that would do is it would cause the other routers on the link, the ones that are you know, real routers, to do pretty much the same thing that the local configuration would do. Ignore any received LSAs. Don't um, request any LSAs during the database exchange. Uh, and consider that node ineligible for DR or BDR. So again, uh, by doing this, we achieve the same goals. Authentication, non-transit, non direct traffic. No LSA propagation. No DR eligibility. Yes, we need to specify that more. And uh, no link advertisement, I put a little asterisk there because uh, that would work in a point-to-point -point link where one of the routers advertises that it's a monitor. So I, me as the other router won't advertise the link. In a multi-access interface, of course, we would advertise the link because there are other routers in there. So that's uh, pretty much it for the draft. Um, in the list, there was a mention of other possible solutions. So next slide. That's why I did a quick table. Um, of uh, these two solutions at the very beginning and some of the others towards the end. Uh, AC mentioned this ISP that we have all worked 
with, and, and I won't even say where they are, um, which had proposed at some point maintaining stuff in exchange for a long time. Uh, sure, we could do that. That doesn't achieve everything that we want because we could still get direct traffic. We could still, we are still propagating the LSA. Uh, if we don't get full, we don't necessarily propagate the, um, uh, the link, so that's a good thing. Um, both the R-bit and the H-bit for SPV3 and SPV2 pretty much do the same thing. They don't uh, allow transit, which is a good thing, but they still allow their traffic, they still allow propagation of the LSAs, they still allow announcement of the link, etc. And um, 6860 was also mentioned. All 6860 does is it hides the link from the forwarding table. The LSAs are still advertised throughout the, throughout the network, throughout the area. So we still get LSA propagation. We do get um, direct traffic. We, um, yeah, we can get direct traffic. Uh, and of course it doesn't prevent, um, we can avoid, I'm sorry, we can avoid direct traffic uh, because if we hide the links then we can't you know, get to that link. Um, but it doesn't prevent transit, right? Because we're hiding the transit link, the node is not removed from the, from the topology. Right, the topology still can be resolved uh, for transit through that link. So we believe that um, you know, for those okay. specific needs that we have, again, the big one here is protection, not just non-transit and not uh, directing traffic, but also trying to protect the network from a possible misbehaving monitor node. Uh, I'm gonna note that except for the first, uh, the monitoring interface column, where the receiving router, the router say in the network has control over what happens. Everything else depends on the monitoring node to say something, to indicate with a bit that it wants to do something. And of course, there's always the risk that that bit won't be set. Alvaro, can you wrap up? We're, we're yeah. sort of out of time. Uh, I don't understand what you said, but I, I'm done. Yeah, okay. uh, Go ahead, okay. AC. Okay, AC Lindem speaking as a working group uh, member. Yeah, I. I, I wasn't suggesting that we go back to that. I was saying that was the worst way to do it, the way that ISP did it, because we actually had to change code to uh, because we had all this code to get rid of adjacencies that weren't making progress and bring it up and down. Uh, I read this again. I was pretty said you could do everything you wanted without this, but after I read it again, I see that you, uh, I think the one thing you can't do without some extension is that is get rid of the adjacency and any flapping of it on the side of the non-monitoring mode so i don't mind that but i just suggest that for all these things you put the burn it on the new guy the monitoring mode then you get the best backward compatibility even if they don't support it like for instance you don't have to advertise a router lsa you don't need to you know we already have a way to keep from becoming dr you dr priority of zero that'll do it. You don't really need to specify that the other nodes do anything special. So you could really do this, just put the burden on the monitoring node and really have these options just for what the uh, node you're connecting to puts in his LSA. That's, that's, that's my comment now. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying we could do it exactly the same way and it, it might be good to have a formal mechanism for this. Yeah, thank especially you. If you're gonna, especially if you're gonna put the, uh, put the pub sub mechanism on a different node, this node, that node is gonna have to passively monitor both the backbone and the, uh, the, the other network, the non-backbone. Yeah, we'll, we'll think about that. You know, as I said, it makes me a little bit nervous that, that we put all the new machinery on the new node. Uh, because you know if it goes if something goes wrong with it then the rest of the network is screwed. But no, yes. Yeah, but but exactly but exactly it's innocuous. I mean you just don't advertise <laughs> don't say yeah it's easy. Okay. Uh, okay. good point. Thanks Alvaro. Um, and let's get our last presentation. Uh, you came in late so we don't feel too bad about not giving you the whole ten minutes, but you have the remaining time of the meeting. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, so really quick, the only thing the other slide said is that, yeah, we need to update with uh, some of the considerations and uh, you know, get more feedback. 
and uh, as, after we do that, uh, we'll probably want to uh, have this considered for adoption. But you know, just like everyone else says at the, at the last slide. Thank you. All right, thanks. Jeffrey Zhang, uh, presenting Anycast affiliation advertisement. Yep, I'm here. Oh, oh, you're in the room too. Okay. Uh, yep. <laughs> great, great. Uh, and it looks like Jeff, you you did it. Great, thank you. Go. Sure. Okay. Anytime. So this is about uh, um, advertising the affiliated addresses for Anycast address. Um, next up, please. The purpose of this is that uh, there is this use case where when you need to send traffic to uh, any of uh, uh, a, a set of devices that own that uh, Anycast address, um, typically you just send, use the Anycast address as your destination address and then the closest one will get, get the packet. And if you happen to have ECMP to some of those, then the, you get load balancing. And some, but if you don't have ECMP, the, oh, it's always the, the closest one that gets the traffic. So what if you really want to do low balancing even when there is no ECMP? Um, so that is one use case and there may be some other use cases as well. Next slide, please. So this slide actually described the uh, specific use cases, uh, use case uh, that, uh, that I just talked about, but I'm going to skip there. Uh, the skip it. Next one, please. So this ISS uh, N flag come to the picture. Um, that flag is set when the prefix identifies an ad ad advertising router. So one may think that uh, what if you uh, set N flag on, on the, those uh, affiliate addresses then, um, but that's not enough because um, it only, the N flag only says that uh, this, uh, this address belongs to this router. It does not carry other semantics. Um, we do need explicit uh, uh, advertisement, uh, advertisement of the affiliation. Next slide, please. So there are four reasons I listed here. Um, just because a node advertises two local addresses, A and B, it does not mean that they are always exchangeable. That's num reason number one. And Number two is that affiliation may have to be one way. Um, traffic desti destined to an Anycast address may use an affiliated address, but the other way may not be desired or should not be allowed at all. For example, if your network allows a transient node to change the Anycast address to an affiliated address, then once that change is done, you must not change it back to a, another affiliated address because uh, you could get in the routing loops that way. Um, and then number three, a node may have uh, uh, different Anycast addresses, each with a different set of affiliated addresses. Um, and finally, number four, even when um, all the, those addresses are reachable, you may want to withdraw the affiliation advertisement because you don't want the uh, the Anycast address to be replaced with a affiliated, affiliated address. Next slide, please. So for that reason, we want to advertise the uh, affiliation. Um, in IGP, we would do it in a Anycast affiliations, affiliation sub TLV that is attached to either ISS extended reachability TLV or OSPv2 extended prefix TLV or OSPv3 intra or inter area prefix TLV. That is for Anycast host prefix. It basically includes a list of, of affiliated, affiliated addresses. Um, next slide, please. That's uh, for BGP, so I'll just skip it. It, it can all easily be done. Um, so, uh, next next slide. To summarize, um, we want to advertise uh, uh, addresses affiliated with the Anycast address. Um, they can be easily done. Um, uh, I want to seek comments here. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we still have a couple minutes. Uh, Linda, go ahead. Jeffrey, that's a good draft. Um, so um, in our other draft, the 5G edge compute draft, we also um, include this portion. However, we did it slightly differently. Um, we use the um, 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 flex algorithm to uh, identify the topology where this um, information is relevant, uh, applicable. Because this uh, binding of any cache to the unicast address doesn't have to be um, touched, uh, intercepted by every every node in the in the domain. What do you think about that approach? Maybe we can talk offline on that. I I guess we'll have to talk about it offline because here in this room it's actually difficult for me to to hear clearly uh, the audio. Uh, uh, it's it's not that. Uh, um, the volume uh, is not enough, but uh, somehow it's not very clear. Um, but I think uh, uh, we can follow up off, uh, offline, and uh, as long as everyone else can hear it, uh, we, we should can still. Uh, okay. Linda, I muted you because you're echoing back into the room. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll mute AC? Quick, quick AC Linda Cisco Systems. Quick clarifying question. So the idea is the ingress would you would use the anycast to find a service, then use one of the affiliated addresses or load balance between them. Is that correct? Uh, correct. That's one one of the use cases uh, we have identified. But in theory, it could be used for any other purposes where you uh, this affiliation could give you. Okay. Would you, you wouldn't expect everybody everybody in the path to use it, would you? Um, like to, I, I guess to send with, to send with the, the, to send, <laughs> that would be, I mean, it'd be kind of complex, I guess, I guess to, you know, do that in the data plane, if everybody had to keep, uh, if people other than the ingress had to keep the, uh, the association, the mapping anyway. Um, so because of, uh, it's IGP, uh, you have uh, once you advertise that information, it's everywhere anyway. So in theory, a transit router could do uh, could change that uh, 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 if an operator or, or allows that. Um, indeed, if you really do that, then um, once you change it to a, a affiliate address, you should not change it back. That's one of the reasons I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you change back and forth, you may get into routing loops. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, how about you, Les? Do you want to take the last comment? Jeff, I, so the IGPs already have the uh, what's needed to identify any cast advertisements and unicast advertisements and the sources of those advertisements. Um, so I don't think we need further extensions there. What I don't understand very clearly um, is the need for the mapping of a particular anycast address to a particular unicast address. If you could clarify that in you know, either on the list or if, uh, an update to the draft, uh, that would be helpful. Um, so in uh, slide number three, I, I talked about the ISIS NBIT, NFLAG, that is not enough. Um, I don't know if there are other ways to uh, advertise uh, affiliation yeah yeah we also have we now have a an, sorry to interrupt we, we have an a flag as well that's that's okay. fairly new so i'll look into that i'll follow up okay yeah. great Thank you. okay yeah, everybody a, uh, a flag is the standard over. though that's a, that's a pr proposed draft right a draft uh, so i think you know it's going to happen yeah okay so I'll look at that, there, there will be an a bit uh jeffrey will uh well not jeffrey anyway yeah okay so that's it we ran out of time we're over time uh but we're the last people i guess that's okay to run a couple minutes over thanks everybody for coming and um uh we'll maybe next time we'll keep 10 minutes at the end instead of five minutes <laughs> since we did run out again uh, hey, and, and hopefully see everybody in Philadelphia, Philly or Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah, thanks.
Th thanks, everybody. And thanks, Jeff, uh, for managing the local queue and sharing the local slides. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Pleasure. See you all in uh, Philadelphia. Bye. Thank you.